Um, welcome. Um, you've just heard, um, I'm VP of Engineering at uh, Red Hat, where I run all the, uh, the middleware teams, um, JBoss. Uh, I'm going to have to, as I found on the train coming down this morning, uh, take a one-hour presentation and stick it into a 30-minute presentation. Uh, I'm not here to sell you anything. Basically, what I'm going to try and do is tell you about things, uh, experiences that we at Red Hat have learned over the last few years um, by taking you know, microservices practices and principles and trying to use them internally, feedback we've had from our customers and our communities, and also uh, things I've heard and experienced at other conferences like this uh, over the last uh, four or five years. Um, this is just some background on, on me. Um, like I said, 60 minute talk, 30 minutes, not going to go into this too much. Uh, essentially, like maybe a few of you in the audience have been around for quite a while, uh, been involved in a number of different waves of the industry um, over the last uh, 30 plus years, um, at the edge or sometimes right in the middle of them. Uh, so, as the title is supposed to try and give you an indication, this is uh, what, I, what I think is a presentation that if Tolkien had been around, I'm pretty sure he would have been deep into microservices, and this is the presentation he would have given. So we're going to go on a little adventure. And of course, if you're going to go on an adventure, you need a map. And this is the map we will use. Uh, those of you with really good eyesight might be able to make out some of the things that are in there, but don't worry. Uh, we will be uh, going through this, uh, and I'm sure the organizers will put this up online later on if you, if you want to take it and, and use it, hopefully, in some of your own education. Uh, this is us. Uh, we're kind of in the middle, um, between there and there. Um, if you can't make it out, or if you don't know what the hell the movie is, it's uh, a Monty <coughs> Python movie. Uh, so we're somewhere, as you'll find out, somewhere between Corba and the uh, Trough of Disillusionment. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're, uh, we're in the Misty Mountains, and uh, there's a ring, and um, I'm not going to really have time to go into this ring. That might be a subsequent uh, presentation. But uh, it's known as the Ring of Continuous Delivery. And if you've seen the movie, uh, this is a Wallace and Gromit a movie, I highly recommend you watch it. This particular video is probably available on YouTube somewhere. Take a look at it. Think Continuous Delivery, OK? We haven't actually got that ring yet. This is where we're going. We are going to the Lonely Mountain, and we are trying to uh, find uh, the Holy Grail. Not quite sure if we're there yet. Um, as you heard earlier, I do have one or two opinions on this. OK, so uh, we'll step out of uh, talking for a minute and go to uh, Terminator. Um, and essentially, you know, what goes around comes around. So we start with monoliths. Monoliths are bad, right? We've heard some people this morning talk a lot about how monoliths are bad. Um, and why are monoliths bad? Well, because, you know, if you don't have your architecture set right, uh, and, you know, monoliths grow and grow and grow, you get these big balls of mud. And if nobody has heard of the big ball of mud, do Google search for it. Uh, there's a really good uh, paper on the topic. And monoliths are obviously evil. So that's why we need to get away from monoliths. And another pop culture uh, thing here. As the great poet Bob Dylan said, times are changing, though. Monoliths are bad. We need to move to something else. And over the last few years, you know, cloud has been uh, a really big thing. Pardon me, a really big thing. Uh, public, private, hybrid clouds. Then we saw Linux containers take off. But again, if any of you have been around long enough, you'll know containers have existed for longer than Linux. I do work for Red Hat. We're obviously a very big Linux company, um, and we've been involved in containers uh, for a long, long time, even you know before Docker. Uh, but you have to recognize containers themselves, you know, it did not start in Linux. Uh, and then, you know, now we're seeing microservices and, you know, the top of the pyramid, the Nirvana, Nirvana that all of this type builds up to is DevOps, where you no longer have these two warring factions of developers and operations. They kind of get together, uh, they mix and they match, and everybody is a developer and an operations guy. So, you know, why are we re-architecting around microservices? Uh, again, unfortunately, because we had presentations earlier, I can maybe uh, not spend too much time on this, but we want to be more agile. 
Uh, you know, we want to be able to release independent components a lot more quickly than we have been able to with these really evil uh, monoliths that we saw earlier. We want to have these independent uh, services versioned separately. We want to have separate teams working on them, uh, so they're independently maintained. This is a, uh, you know, an architecture that greenfield developers should start with from the get-go. They shouldn't consider anything else. Remember, those evil monoliths, get away from them, go straight to microservices. Brownfield, de Brownfield developers absolutely need to be moving towards microservices today. Uh, if they're not, they're evil, and they should be cast aside. So anybody who is working in a Brownfield environment, which, to be honest, is everybody, unless you're a startup, uh, you're either going to be adopting microservices, you're either thinking about adopting microservices, or your job is on the line because you're evil. Okay. Now. Monoliths are evil, but maybe they're not. Maybe there are different types of evil. Maybe there's a spectrum of evil. If anybody has not heard of or read the majestic monolith, you absolutely should do. So in all seriousness, monoliths aren't evil. Microservices aren't good. There's something in between. And if you read the majestic monolith, you'll find that a lot of the things that people want to do with, with microservices, becoming more agile, be able to release more frequently, can actually be accomplished with a monolithic architecture, if you approach it right. Microservices are like everything. They're a good tool for people. But not everybody is going to benefit from them now or potentially ever. And if you have a brownfield environment, if you have monoliths, then the majestic monolith is absolutely a good approach to take, particularly if you're easing into, into this. So. Um, Thanks to uh, Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. Back to uh, microservices. If you go into this nirvana, you absolutely have to be re-architecting everything from the ground up on microservices. So it is microservices all the way down, although that's total. So what are they? And again, you know, we've had these, a number of presentations where people have talked about this already, but you know, I'm going to repeat a little bit. You have your traditional evil mo uh, monolith over here. Then, you know, a few years ago, um, now around about 2002-ish, really, till around about 2011, 2012, we had uh, service-oriented architecture where we were breaking down our, our evil monolithic application into slightly less evil, larger services. And now we're moving to the angels, the really pure, really, really nice, uh, everything's good microservices, where we're breaking down those uh, slightly evil, slightly good service-oriented architecture services into even more smaller-grained um, microservices. But what is the definition of a microservice? Uh, and for better or for worse, there is no standard definition. This is the one that's often used, um, and you can do a Google for it. So Martin Fowler, ThoughtWorks, um, you know, I've highlighted the bits in black, but that, that's not to say the other bits aren't important. It's just you know, what Martin is saying is that you know, when you're using uh, microservices, you're designing software applications as suites of independently deployable services. There is no precise definition of this architectural style. If that's not raising alarm bells already, then it probably should. Automated deployment and intelligence in the endpoint. That's good stuff, OK? So there's, there's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff. So moving along our, our little journey on our map, uh, we've now moved into um, Distributed systems. Um, hands up anybody who has not heard of the fallacy of distributed computing. Google it. <laughs> OK. Uh, and, and along with the, the fallacy of distributed systems, one, one quick summary of it is shit happens. OK. And that's the little emoji there, if anybody didn't know what it was. So we're moving along our journey from monoliths to microservices. But we still don't know what the hell microservices are. You know, isn't it service-oriented architecture? We just saw a diagram earlier, which would suggest it's based on it. But you know, what are these things called pizza teams? You keep hearing about a pizza team is a good analogy for uh, a group to work on a microservice. Or you might hear they're big enough to fit in your head. Uh, and are they really only for unicorns like Netflix and Amazon? And you know, what the hell is a unicorn? And these days, it's not just unicorns. It's apparently cats with laser guns riding on the backs of uni unicorns that should only be looking at microservices. So Adrian Cockroft, who used to be uh, chief architect uh, at Netflix and is now at, at Amazon, 
Uh, he's probably one of the first, if not the first, people to, to coin the term microservices. And even back then, 2014, you know, he was attributing them to service-oriented architecture. They were absolutely started off being influenced by SOA. Some people, some companies, uh, some consultants, for one reason or another, uh, over the last few years have distanced microservices from SOA, but if you've been into SOA and you understand the good things that SOA was trying to push, you absolutely should understand the good things that microservices can do for you. There was a lot of hype around SOA as well, so don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting SOA was, was good, but it certainly wasn't evil. So let, you know, back in 2014, when this was tweeted, you know, uh, Adrian was really referring to presentations he was giving even two years prior to so microservices and so on, they must be related, surely, and, and they are related. The difference really, you know, without going through all this, is with service-oriented architecture, we tended to have these services, whether they're big or small, that were shared between applications. You developed a service, a messaging service, a booking service, a, you know, a taxi reservation service, whatever, and it was shared between two, three, four, 100 different applications. It had a well-defined interface. You could change the implementation without, change, you know, without necessarily having to affect the, the, the users of that. Uh, but the, obviously, the problem there is, because it's shared between lots of different applications, if you take it down, you want to change the, the API, you want to really play around with it and make it better, you really have to then go around and talk to all of these different applications, which could be globally distributed. So microservices, if you look at what the best practices are today, they tend to be these monoliths, these really evil monoliths, of course, that are broken apart into components, but they still tend to be used within a single application. If you're starting to move towards an architecture where you are developing microservices that are, that are being shared by more than one application, and particularly more than one application that is around the world, you may be seeing yourself move outside of what is currently defined as being a, a good microservices architecture. But apart from that, they share a lot of things. They share you know, API interface sep uh, implementation separation, contract definitions, and as with SOA, you know, HTTP tends to be the de facto communication pattern. All right, so pizza teams. Great, I'll have a pizza team, and that's as big as I need to have my team. Pizzas can be big, okay? Um, so that's not really a good way of determining how I should actually define my microservice. What about these uh, can fit with, within the size of a head? Again, that means a monolith's a microservice because, you know, 100 terabytes of data you store in your head. So I can have a microservice that is a couple of gig in size, still a microservice. So again, not really a good definition. And we move on. Uh, we're still in the shit happens area. Uh, but we're moving much more towards uh, distributed systems. Um, microservices don't exist in isolation. You know, one microservice is probably not going to be useful by itself, because if it is, it may well be this evil monolith in the end. Or it could be one of these really big service-oriented architecture services. So if they don't exist in isolation, what about communication between them? What about failover? You know, we heard uh, earlier, you know, microservices fail. What about orchestration of these services and, you know, coordination and consistency? Not just consistency of, of data, but consistency of, uh, of behavior and consistency of API changes. And there's lots of other things that you should be starting to think about if these things do not exist in isolation. And you know, maybe some of you guys have already gone down this route with microservices and you've considered these and you've tackled them. That, that's good, but I could say you know, the background for this is a lot of people that, that, was, that I am meeting and you know, I know other people in other companies that are meeting are still not quite ready to go down the microservices route because they understand that there are some problems there and they're not quite at the convinced stage. But ultimately, I believe it all comes down to architecture, architecture, architecture. And here's another quote, um, and there's a reference there if you want to look at it. But basically, um, this article that's on InfoQ back in 2014, so you know, August 2014, almost three years ago, microservices was big then. What the, what the guy in this quote is basically saying is, if you do not understand the architecture and the way in which 
your monolith developed, why the hell would you think that breaking it apart into smaller components is going to make it easier? All you'll do is if you had a big ball of mud to start with, now you'll have a distributed balls of mud. And we all know how managing distributed systems is so much easier than managing a centralized system. OK, so Corba. Well, the hell has Corba got to do with microservices? Well, probably a lot more than you might think. Anybody here who doesn't know what Corba is? Anybody here who doesn't know what DCE is? Oh, Google it. OK, so Corba was this really sexy distributed system back in the, uh, the late 90s. Industry standard, well, apart from Microsoft. Um, so back in, in the Corba days, there was uh, a Corba architecture. And Corba essentially was a, you've got to understand that back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, when Corba uh, really kicked off, multi-threaded programming was not the norm. There were no programming languages with threads in them natively. And I know there's lots of people around in this room going, oh my god. Right? So the unit of encapsulation and the unit of threading in a Corba architecture was the process. You fired up an operating system process to do more work. Okay? Or you wrote your own thread package using set jump and long jump in C. Those of you who don't know what set jump and long jump are, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> So in the Cobra architecture, you had lots of services, and they were interacted with from, uh, by clients over um, Cobra's bespoke protocol called IIOP. And essentially, even when we started to have multi-threading, the architecture still remained as services, core services, a messaging service, a data service, a transaction service, a concurrency control service, a naming service, registry for those people who are really into microservices. Uh, and everything was a service. It's a service-oriented architecture. These days, oh, anybody here not know who the hell Neil Sadaka is? <sighs> <laughs> you keep putting your hand up to everything. <laughs> Look him up, OK? These days, we are, because of the microservices approach, approach, because of things like containers and Kubernetes, we are seeing our monolithic applications being broken up into, you know, machines, uh, virtual machines, JVMs, the JVM within a, a container, for instance. So we're, we're moving back to the services architecture, which, as I said, is very similar to what Corba was pushing us back in the day. So like I said at the very start, what goes around comes around. OK, so moving further on into the distributed systems landscape, you guys by now hopefully are getting that microservices is a distributed environment, OK? Um, and because, you know, as this picture there says, you know, distributed systems, you know, how hard can it be? And here's a tweet that's literally only uh, about four or five weeks ago. Um, microservices, because designing, implementing, deploying, monitoring, messaging, managing, and supporting network AP APIs is so fucking easy, OK? This guy gets it. I don't know who the hell he is, but he absolutely gets it. OK, so what are microservices? <coughs> They are distributed systems. We are being pushed back to an architecture which is very similar to the kind of architectures we had back in the 90s. One of the advantages of high performance um, hardware and networks and new languages of the late 90s, early 2000s was even though we were doing a lot of distributed systems research in the 80s and the 90s and we were talking about hundreds and hundreds of machines talking to each other and even that was fairly theoretical, with languages like Java and then C Sharp, and the fact that we had so much more memory in our laptops and our desktops, and we had so much more threading available in our languages themselves, we started to co-locate all this stuff. Even if you look at Java EE, which evolved from Corba, the architecture is fundamentally the same, or at least it was initially, but all people were doing, all vendors were doing, was taking the Corba architecture and co-locating all this stuff. And that's the architectures that we've had over the years. Now we're pulling it all apart again and pushing it around the place and forgetting an awful lot of good things that we knew back in the 80s and 90s. So, like I said, services are inherently separate machines, or you know, they may be separate containers within, within separate machines. Communication between these microservices is going to be slower than inter-process communication within the same process. Failures can and will happen independently. Cascading failures can and will happen. Consistency concerns become more of a challenge. Like I said, shit happens. And oh, the last bullet, which for some reason doesn't show here, but did show on the slides, 
We are essentially throwing developers back into distributed systems 101 without telling them it's distributed systems 101. And it's not all sunshine and roses. So microservices today present a lot of the challenges that we had in distributed systems in the 80s and 90s, and even you know, uh, the 21st century. And the need for things like reliable messaging and transactions and consistency and caching, et cetera, they are going to come in. You may not think that you need them, but if, you're more, if you even start to develop things that are much more than hello world in microservices, you will need this sort of stuff. Um, obviously, it's a polyglot environment. Again, this was something that Corba did. Who would have guessed it? People want to write in more than one language. Uh, and they, need, they, they will need to be available in more than one, more than one environment. And, and REST over HTTP tends to be the de facto standard at the moment. But will there be other protocols? So we're not here yet. We're not quite at the trough of disillusionment. And we're not quite at the emperor's new clothes over there. You do know about the emperor's new clothes. You have heard that one, haven't you? Good, OK. So you don't need to Google that one. Uh, but, you know, we're not that far off, I think. And there are a lot of unanswered questions. Um, things like, you know, what is the unit of deployment? Is it the container? Is it the virtual machine with lots of containers in it? If it's the container, does the container have one microservice in it, or does it have a collection of microservices in it? If it has a collection of microservices in it, is it a macroservice? And when I say not, these are unanswered, I don't actually mean they're unanswered. What I mean is there's still a lot of discussion going on. Despite the fact that microservices have been around for, in a computing term, decades, but really only like four or five years, there's still a lot that's unknown out there. Um, yeah, where do Linux containers fit in, or containers in general? Um, you know, containers, maybe they should have, if they have more than one service in them, maybe they should be related services. So you could still have many, 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 many microservices within a container. Each of them is a well-defined microservice developed by different teams. You stick them in a container so they fail as a, as a, as a unit. Distributed systems, one of the well-known, um, hopefully by most people, apart from, apart from you, I know. Uh, I don't mean to pick on you. <laughs> But one of the most well-known definitions of a distributed system is where failure of a service somewhere you have never heard of causes your application to stop. So if you have collections of microservices that if one of them fails, the others can't make any, any forward progress, you might need to just stick them all in the same container so they fail as a unit. Again, you know, it's not something that's generally agreed at the moment. What about immutability? We hear a lot about immutability these days. Docker or Linux containers are not required to be immutable. If you've used Linux containers for a while, you'll understand that you can fire up a, a container, you can make changes to it, and you can go back to it later on when it's gone down. It's things like Kubernetes that start to impose uh, immutability. And I'm not suggesting immutability is bad. I'm just saying once you combine the two, we need to start thinking about immutable architectures. And what does that really mean? Because something that worked well in a Docker container is not necessarily, necessarily going to work well when you add Docker and, and, and Kube together. You know, what about reactive event-driven microservices? Asynchronous and uh, FLP. Anybody here not heard of the FLP? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Google that one. Uh, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson. Um, if you've heard of CAP theory, it's not the same thing, but people quote it at the same thing. So if you search for CAP, you might find FLP. So yet more unanswered questions. Uh, you know, do we need to evolve our people as well as our software? Absolutely we do, but how? We heard earlier today you know, about Conway's work. <coughs> Polyglot, of course, we need to be able to develop these things in, you know, in the language of the day. Uh, but again, you know, what's the impact? particularly if it's a language that nobody else in the, in the uh, company understands, and you come in as a contractor, write something in a particular language, and then you go. Uh, they're going to be, it may be a fantastic microservice today, but in six months' time, if they need to revise it, and you're not there, it could be a good way of keeping your job, though. Um, where does state reside? Again, you know, does it reside in the container? Maybe not, uh, particularly if you start to put Kubernetes in there, because, like I said earlier, you've got immutable architectures. How do we handle versioning of state, of APIs, and of implementations? How does communication occur? It can't always be HTTP. Give me a break, OK? HTTP is great, fantastic, scales to the web. But it performs like shit, OK? Even HTTP 2 is fast, but it ain't anywhere as fast as a pure binary protocol, OK? So there's going to be other ways in, that you can communicate. Things like gRPC are becoming quite popular. 
And I personally find it really nice that RPC is back in vogue when we went through like 15 years of how RPC is evil and leads to monolith. Uh, logging, yeah, we have to, absolutely have to do logging, but there's such a lot of choice. And debugging and tracing, it's essential to this because it's a distributed system, but there's lots of choice and you know, it's still evolving. What do I do? Uh, so where's the future? I think we're going to get a lot more success stories. We're going to get a lot more failure stories. I don't know which is going to outweigh which. Uh, we're going to see a lot more emphasis on how software fo first, first approaches and help can help. Do not believe anybody. If I was to come to a conference next and tell you how software first is going to solve your problem, don't believe me. Okay? Um, are we going to have monolithic microservices? Quite probably. It's a bit like REST. A lot of people were saying they were doing REST for years. They weren't doing REST. They were doing HTTP. But they got away with saying they were REST. Uh, just remember that 100 terabyte answer and the pizza team. Um, we're going to have monolithic clusters of microservices. I think probably we will. What about macroservices? Literally, a year after microservices started to hype, people were talking about nanoservices. We even got people talking about Pico services two years ago. <laughs> what the hell is a Pico service? Is it like one line of code? <laughs> I don't know. Remember distributed balls of mud? And also, remember we're heading towards the distributed systems nirvana, because that's what microservices will give us. After 60 years of developing with distributed systems, are we really going to get there this time? Probably not. It's probably going to be two steps forward and one step backwards. Something's going to come after microservices. And I think this is going to be my next talk in about four or five years' time, because obviously Lord of the Rings comes after The Hobbit. Uh, okay, so like a one-hour talk into 25 minutes. Sorry if I rushed through everything, but I know we have a panel session after this. Uh, I don't know if we have time to ask any questions. Uh, like I said, we have a panel session. Thank you very much.